Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. <clears throat> uh, I first want to make sure that the back row, can you hear me OK? Yes? Fine. Um, American exceptionalism. What, what is American exceptionalism? Is it something we can specifically that we can grasp? Or is it something fuzzy and indistinct that we can't easily describe, and yet we all know it when we see it? What is American exceptionalism to Americans? And what is it to those who, one might say, have the misfortune of not being Americans? Now, as someone who has lived here in the United States, <laughs> I'm going to linger on some of these uh, slides uh, several times, because uh, uh, some of them, uh, you really need to think about them when you see them. Um, as someone who's lived here in the United States for almost 40 years, but has had United States citizenship only since 2009, uh, when you work for the United Nations, you, work for your, 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 you don't work for your country, but you work with your own nationality. Uh, and I only, my wife and I only applied for green cards after I retired from the UN. Anyway, I enter this topic with some caution. After all, who am I to offer comments on American exceptionalism? except as an outsider walking into a dangerous territory. I feel rather like this gentleman here. <laughs> I'm going to address this, uh, this subject in two parts. In the first, I shall look at the topic historically. As, I, as some of you know, I always do this when I give that talks. Notwithstanding the colonial influences of the Dutch, French, and Spanish, and the immigrants of many nations, who have contributed so much in energy and creativity to the melting pot of America. I shall draw largely on the development of revolutionary and exceptionalist thought from English roots. As in the beginning, those were the influences and the differences of opinion that led to that little, bit, uh, that little um, dust up in 1776 from which American exceptionalism initially stemmed. And then in the second part, I shall look at current American exceptionalism from a different angle, and with my tongue sometimes firmly in my cheek. The topic of how and why America is different has spawned many books, articles, and speeches down the years. American exceptionalism is a big subject, addressed by the right and the left in the political spectrum, with strong proponents and sometimes equally strong critics. This is a short selection of books written comparatively recently, and in fact, the, the bottom one is actually only being published today. And you may have seen the uh, article in the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal over the weekend by uh, uh, the Cheney duo. However, we need to go much further back. The 17th and 18th centuries in Europe were years of conservatism, hierarchy, and hereditary privilege. Most of the agricultural land was owned by families of the nobility, and at the top, of course, were the monarchies. In different forms, there were stirrings of parliamentary mechanisms that were nibbling at rural authority to control national expenditure and make decisions of war and peace. But noblesse oblige and acceptance of the established order of things largely held sway at all levels. The other august authorities besides the monarchies were, of course, the church mostly Catholic, some forms of Protestantism, and in Eastern Europe, of course, Orthodox, each with its own ecclesiastical hierarchy, and each convinced that it was right. And in all these institutions, change was not welcome. But exploration abroad and mercantile expansion had opened up opportunities for those wriggling uncomfortably under existing country, conditions to do something different. Already in the 1650s, following the Civil War in England and the beheading of King Charles I, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes had rattled the cage of established thinking. He wasn't against monarchy, far from it. He argued that effective government, whatever its form, must have absolute authority. Its powers must be neither divided nor limited. But he also insisted that while regarding sovereign governments as having absolute authority, the subjects of those governments themselves must have the liberty of disobeying some of their government's commands. 
Hobbes was followed by John Locke, who went further and in 1689 published two treatises of government. In the first, he argued against divinely ordained, hereditary, absolute monarchy. And in the second, he maintained that the only legitimate governments were those that had the consent of the people. Therefore, any government that ruled without the consent of the people could, in theory, be overthrown. These were dangerous words, open to charges of season, uh, treason in, uh, in those days of the late 1680s. Locke himself was driven into exile, and in his lifetime, he very carefully never admitted that who, to being the author of these two treatises. Things were also stirring in the settlements uh, of colonial America. Sir Edward Cook, Chief Justice in England, had annoyed King James I in the early 1600s by arguing that even the king should be subject to common law. And Cook is generally regarded as the source of the dictum, a man's house is his castle. Domus sua quique est tutissium refugium. Where shall a man be safe if it not be in his own house? He was involved in writing the charter of the Virginia Company, and his legal views and writings later became the bedrock of study by Thomas Jefferson and others. Both John Adams and Patrick Henry argued from Cook treatises to support their revolutionary positions in the 1770s. And to the north, in 1630, on board the ship Arabella, and about to establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop gave this famous admonition to the Puritan settlers on how they must conduct themselves and set an example. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon the hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. Now you'll note that Winthrop was not saying specifically at all <clears throat> how exceptional the settler should be. In fact, he was giving them a warning. He rather he was cautioning them that if they weakened in their resolve and their new Puritan settlement failed, then their failure would be trumpeted around the world. Nevertheless, thus it was that the seeds of American exceptionalism were being planted in Boston and New Haven, in New Amsterdam and Delaware, in Jamestown and Philadelphia. There was no single unifying theory, but a coming together of ideas that there needed to be a dramatic change from the long established systems of government of the past, and that the founding of those new communities in the new world would provide the opportunity for that change. Once planted, the seeds germinated in the 1700s into resistance against the old order and determined opposition to governance from far away London. And in turn, nurtured by others such as Franklin, George Mason, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Paine, in the last quarter of the 18th century, the movement for change crystallized into revolution and independence. New ideas, new values, American exceptionalism was born. And indeed, the great seal of the uh, United States, as you'll know, is on the back of the $1 bill, Novus Ordo Seclorum, new order for the, for the ages. So the concepts in set, up, set out in the Declaration of Independence were staggeringly exceptional in themselves. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whatever any form of government, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Thus, from the very outset, this new country was moving down a very different path from the old order. This was an ideology. 
This was a creed of liberty and freedom and individualism and egalitarianism. This was liberalism in its 18th century sense, for the individual, against monarchs and against aristocracy, against hereditary privilege, against overweening government, essentially anti-state. It's not loyalty to a nation as such, but a loyalty to a set of ideas and values. And in his book, one of the books I showed you on the earlier, American Exceptionism, A Double-Edged Sword, Seymour Lipset said this. Now, it is sometimes said that it was Alexis de Tocqueville who first coined the term American Exceptionism. And well, if it's so, I've not been able to find it. However, in his 1835 book, Democracy in America, he did say this. The position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in the similar one. And I'm going to leave you to read it on the screen for the rest. But to me, rather than noting America's creed of ideas and values, de Tocqueville seemed to be attaching more significance to the more materialistic, practical aspects of the American lifestyle. By the late 1840s, the population of the United States had grown to some 23 million, and there were territorial ambitions. In 1845, there came a new term, manifest destiny. The philosophy that underpinned this term was that America had a special destiny to expand democracy, and therefore had a superior moral right to govern areas where other interests would not respect this goal. It was seen in the context of Texas, which at that time was still part of Mexico. The Oregon Territory, at that time held by the British. And later acquisitions, later in the century, such as Guam and the annexation of Hawaii in 1898. Although a different term, Manifest Destiny carried that same sense of moral responsibility as American exceptionalism. But the 19th century was still years of internal development for the United States as it, as it expanded westwards and grew in economic strength. And abroad, in the world at large, it was still the years of the British swinging their weight about and proclaiming their own special role in the form of Pax Britannica. Then came the 20th century and the upheavals of two world wars, the sweeping away of many monarchies, the elevation of the United States to superpower status. Pax Britannica was replaced by the American century. Now, oddly enough, one of the people aware of the notion of American exceptionalism in the 20th century was Joseph Stalin. And in 1927, leading American communist Jay Lovestone had said that Marxism had no place in America and the American proletariat were not open to revolution. And this brought a sharp rebuttal from Stalin, who brushed Lovestone aside and demanded that he stop this heresy of American exceptionalism. The years of the Great Depression that followed and the lines of the art of work in Hungary that followed in the 1930s seemed in those years at least uh, to confirm Stalin's view. In World War II, Britain and Western Europe were saved yet again, first by, the, uh, by overwhelming American military power and then after the war, exhausted Europe was saved by the Marshall Plan. And on the other side of the world, the United States achieved the unconditional surrender of Japan and dictated the terms of the constitution of the new Japan. And with the surge of American economic and military power in the second half of the 20th century, the ideas of American exceptionalism came again to the fore. With them at home came the reaffirmation of egalitarianism and the worth of the individual, and in foreign policy, the belief that it was America's role and particular responsibility to export democracy, liberty, and freedom abroad. And in the 50 years following the end of World War II, there can be no doubt about the far-reaching extent of American influence. Henry Kissinger. Have we got him? Henry Kissinger, in this book, World Order, pointed out that no other country would have had the idealism and the resources uh, to take on such a range of challenges or the capacity to succeed in them. American idealism and exceptionalism were the driving forces behind the building of the new international order. And then in 1974, Ronald Reagan gave a speech with the title, The Shining City Upon a Hill. 
and his, in his own unique avuncular style, laced his speech with anecdotes, and then he listed uh, the many ways in which America had achieved progress and greatness above all others. And he ended with these words that you see on the screen. Now, for the sake of political balance, let me also recall the statement made by President Obama at a commencement speech uh, at the US Air Force Academy in May 2012, when he said that the United States is exceptional and will always be, quote, the one indispensable nation in world affairs. Newt Gingrich, in his book, A Nation Like No Other, Why American Exceptionalism Matters, maintains the view that America's greatness America's exceptional greatness is not based on the fact that America is the most powerful, most prosperous, and most generous nation on earth. Rather, he says, these things are the result of American exceptionalism. And if this was the case, one might expect that other nations would clamor at the door to adopt similar policies. Yes, many Americans look with envy at America's general standard of living. They flock to American movies. They enjoy jazz and blues and rock. They applaud American generosity. They welcome American innovation, vitality, and spirit of optimism. They respect American accomplishments in science and research. They recognize the top class education in the best American universities. But do other industrialized democratic countries rally to the banner of American exceptionalism? No, they do not. I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan's remarks about the nine most dangerous words in the English language. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. <laughs> Generally speaking, it seems to me, Americans like to live their lives despite government, whereas Europeans and the cities of other industrialized and democrat democratic countries expect to live their lives with the help of government. They accept that an important role of government is to level the playing field, stop the rich getting too rich and the poor from being too poor, make regulations that respect individual rights, but at the same time benefit the community as a whole, provide freedoms, but at the same time assert controls for the common good. Each country has its own way, um, but in essence, the systems in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada are not based on a set of ideas at all. They are a contract between those that govern and those that are governed. And that contract is rooted in national history and culture. Now here's a thought to ponder. One of the aspects that is different here in America is the apparent reversal of the terms conservative and liberal. It has always seemed a little odd to me that the Republicans don't call themselves liberal and the Democrats don't call themselves conservative. In several respects, what Europeans call liberalism is what Americans call conservatism. Liberalism in Europe is resistance against state authority and an emphasis on laissez-faire. Liberals in Europe object to restrictions placed on them by government, and they reject the concepts of aristocracy and social class hierarchy. Conservatives in Europe, on the other hand, while extolling the virtues of private enterprise, prefer to maintain the status quo and the st stability of established governmental authority. And it can be argued that no other industrialized democratic country defines the terms conservative and liberal as here in the United States. A Canadian intellectual and philosopher, George Grant, once commented that Americans who call themselves conservatives are in fact old fashioned liberals. American conservatism dislikes government focuses on the virtues of competition and links to free enterprise, and thereby places individual rights above the rights and obligations of the community as a whole. Thus, there is no room in American society for socialism, a welfare state, national state provided health care, or a decent standard of living provided by the government for the poor. And now I come to the second part of my talk, and here's where I really step into the lion's den. And if I may mix my classical me metaphors, I come neither to praise Caesar nor to bury him. But why do many non-Americans question the products of American exceptionalism? In day-to-day -day practical terms and away from the lofty ideals and self-praise and patting each other on the back, 
How different is the United States from other industrialized, democratized nations in the rest of the world? Because there is another side to the term exceptionalism, and that is how different are you? Here's a series of charts. Some will amuse you, some may surprise you, and a few may hurt. American exceptionalism, let me start with this one. I hasten to add that this is an American cartoon, not a foreign one. Celsius versus Fahrenheit. Let's start with the simple ones. <laughs> USA is almost alone in the world in using Fahrenheit. All others have moved on and used Celsius, except Puerto Rico, Belize, Cayman Islands, and small American territories such as Palau and Guam. They're so small that you can scarcely see the little orange spots in the Caribbean of Belize and the Cayman Islands. Metric versus imperial. Here the United States is in slightly greater company, but again, the rest of the world has moved on. I'm not urging you to support Lincoln Chaffee as president, <clears throat> but the fact, the fact remains that the only other countries not using the metric system are Liberia and Myanmar. And Myanmar itself, in 2013, announced that they intend to go to metric. And by that, after that happens, you'll be left alone with Liberia. <laughs> now, in 1999, NASA lost a $125 million Mars orbiter because the Lockheed engineering term that built the craft used metric units, while the NASA mission navigation team used imperial units for a key spacecraft operation. The mishap moved the orbiter too close to the Mars atmosphere. The orbiter broke up in pieces and it burnt up. Uh, Britain, of course, is still schizophrenic. Brits buy their gas at the pump in liters and then drive off to cover their distance in miles, not kilometers. The, the Brits buy their milk in liters, but their beer in pints. If you get a quart uh, of milk in in UK, uh, it, it, uh, it actually is 1.136 liters, but it's still the same sort of looking. Mind you, of course, a British quart is different from an American quart anyway, right? Brits buy their jam not in half kilo jars, but in jars of 454 grams. Why? Because that is nearest to one pound. And as far as the jam producers are concerned, it was a damn sight cheaper to, to change the print of the labels than it was to change the size of the jars. Typical Brits, one foot on the land and the other in the boat. Importance of religion in life. Now, according to the Pew Research Center, wealthy, the wealthier industrialized democracies tend to be less religious. But look where the United States is, way out on its own, out there. So the GDP per capita, when you have the, the highest GDP per capita, uh, but you look at all the other countries, Canada, Australia, Britain, France, Israel, Poland, Greece, um, and so on, way down there. Individualism. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this on the screen a bit while you sort of take it in. Um, according to the Pew Research Center again, Americans stand out. Look at the top one for individualism. In other words, 57% of Americans agree, disagree that success in life is pretty much determined by forces outside our control. In other words, Americans like to feel that they can control their own, uh, their own future. And then, of course, there is the work hard bit at the bottom. If you're prepared to take your jacket off and roll your sleeves up, uh, then, again, the United States is, is out on the, on the end of the list. Healthcare spending. Now look at this one. This is a chart of 2009 uh, data, so perhaps 2015 data has changed to some extent. But see how much more is being spent uh, by, in America um, uh, than in other comparative countries. So you've got uh, total expenditure on the bottom, health per capita in US dollars, uh, over 7,000, and the rest of the countries we're talking about are way over there. Here are two more charts of healthcare costs. Again, the United States is on the right, and look how much more you're spending on your healthcare as a percentage of GDP 
than those other countries are. And the OECD average is 9.5%, and the American average is 17.6%. That's how expensive your health care is for you. According to the OECD, the United States spent $8,233 on health per person in 2010. Norway, the Netherlands, and Switzerland are the next highest spenders, but in the same year, they all spent at least $3,000 less per person. The average spending on health care amongst the other 33 developed OECD countries in 2010 was $3,268 per person. The United States is, is, is cost per hospital day. I mean, I mean it, it is just amazingly more expensive here, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the health care is all that much better. The United States is very different. Time off for new parents. This is a, a chart, <clears throat> again by the Pew Research Center, showing uh, what countries give, give by government law not by, but not by private companies, private firms, but by government law, of uh, paid leave for a new, uh, a new parent, and, or protected leave, i.e. unpaid but protected. The United States is at the bottom, zero. The United States gives no time off, paid time off, for a, a, a new baby. And is, it is exceptional by being uh, at the bottom of that, of that list. Paid annual leave and holidays in working days. So while we're looking at time off, here's another OECD chart. These are the countries that give, you can see in the darker color, paid annual leave and then paid holidays. The United States is on the end, on the right. So this is, these, are, these, when you add them all up, are, 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 are why the uh, other democratized, industrialized countries don't really accept the products of American exceptionalism. Education. Here's inf some information on countries according to student scores in maths and science. As you see, the United States is not first, but lies in the 28th position in a tie with Italy. In a list of top universities, the United States rides high. But look at the chart of tuition fees in 2012. Harvard, 38,000. Stanford, 42,000. Yale, 43,000. Meanwhile, in UK, University of Cambridge, 14,000. Imperial College London, 14,000. University of Oxford, 14,000. That's the tuition costs. And as you can see at the bottom, some countries have post-secondary education, which is free. One of those in the bottom left-hand corner is Scotland. US college fees have risen 1,120% since records began in 1978. For example, for two semesters and on-campus living at the University of Vermont for this year, 2015 and 16, the total costs amount to 31,000. That's tuition plus buying books, uh, living costs, uh, for 31,000 for an in-state student and 53,000 dollars for an out-of-state student. That's for one year of a four-year course. And most universities in UK are three years. The last year at high school in UK is equivalent to the first year at an American college. For Bennington College for the same year, the total costs are going to amount to 62,000 dollars. For Middlebury, it's going to be $59,000, much the similar. Student debt. Here's information on college student debt in 2012. Now here, the United States is not the only country with student debt with a, with a, a challenge or a problem. The UK has it as well. But on the other hand, tuition in UK is limited by government, down to £9,000 per year, that works out at $14,000. That's why that figure was at 14,000 before. The total tuition and living costs at public universities in Europe, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are less than in American colleges and universities. In Britain, 
where the British, uh, except British and uh, European Union, Union uh, students in UK, uh, these publicly funded institutions in England and Wales are allowed to charge tuition fees up to a maximum, as I said before, of £9,000 a year. That's $14,000. Income inequality. This chart was published in the Washington Post as a comparison of how much the top 1% take of national pre-tax in income. And we see lots of articles about that in the newspaper, but how often do you see comparison with the other countries that we're talking about? UK, Germany, Canada, Sweden, Ireland. See the huge difference between the two. Shining city on a hill, here's another way of looking at it. Comparison of GDP. Here are two charts showing comparative GDP. Now in the first, as you can see, America is clearly exceptional. The second one compares the GDP of individual states with respective countries around the world. As you can see, if California was an independent country, it by itself would be the eighth richest country in the world. If Texas was an independent country, it would be the 12th richest country in the world. It has the same equivalent uh, GDP as Australia. While we're at it, Vermont's GDP is roughly the same as that of Latvia, but fortunately, Vermont is in a better geographical position. Election costs. Look how much it costs to uh, elect a member of the House of Representatives. Or, or Now, you have a big country uh, um, uh, with much bigger areas for people to travel uh, and, uh, and get their message out. Uh, that I understand. Um, but different countries have different arrangements. And other countries, the rest of the world, doesn't wish to follow the American example. In the United States, the candidates themselves have to raise the bulk of the money to cover their expenses, and they're heavily assisted by interest groups or individuals. But in most other democratized, industrialized countries, the major source of money for elections is public funding. That was the, the costs in the election in Britain in May of this year. In, Uni in the United Kingdom, ever since 1883, there have been strict limits on what a candidate can spend. A candidate can spend in UK no more than $39,000 to have him or herself elected. And these amounts are supplemented by monies from government and national party funds. You see that by each candidate, $39,000 plus 6p per registered voter for rural areas and 9p per registered voter provided by the government uh, for uh, voters in urban areas. It is the political parties that can raise money, not the candidates. And this arrangement means that, unlike here in the United States, the elected member is generally not beholden to return the financial favors of an individual or a business or a group. And in UK, there is also a ban on paid political broadcasting. And this has been a major factor in reducing the amount of money that political parties themselves have to raise. Guns. Guns in private hands. This chart shows the proportion of guns in private hands. Americans have a proportion much higher than almost all other countries in the world. A study in 2013 estimated that there are 88.8 .8 guns per 100 people in the United States. And among industrialized countries, the next highest is Switzerland with 45.7 guns per 100 and Finland with 45.3. And in both countries, the numbers of gun-related deaths in proportion to the population are one-third of those in the United States. The United States has got something like a population of 320 million, and you have almost 300 million guns in private hands. Gun deaths. The United States is on the left. An international comparison chart of gun deaths per 100,000 people. And you see how far out of step the United States is with other countries, and democratized, industrialized countries. 
Currently, there are 92 gun deaths per day in the United States, per day. Uh, and as you can see, in brown, some, the higher proportion of those are suicides, and the lower proportion are, are murders. Mass killings. If we define mass killings as four or more victims, such as Newtown, Aurora, Virginia Tech, and the Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, in just last June. According to a report in USA Today, since 2006, there have been more than 250 mass killings in the United States. That's roughly one every two weeks. Gun control. This is what The Economist said just two months ago about the chances of gun control, for gun control in America. Prison. Incarceration rate. At 716 prisoners per 100,000 people, the United States has proportionately far higher rate in its jails than any other country in the world. The United States population at 320 million is about 4.4% of the global population. And yet, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, at the end of 2013, there were 2,217,000 inmates in federal and state prisons and local jails. In other words, the United States, with only 4.4% of the world population, has a quarter of the world's prison population. And over 30,000 of these are kept in solitary confinement. Some 49,000 Americans are serving life terms without the possibility of ever being released. 45,000, 49,000. In England and Wales, with a population which is just one-sixth of the United States, that number is 55. Capital punishment. This is a slide of countries that have the death penalty, correct as at March of this year. Those in blue have abolished it for all crimes, about abolition of the death penalty is a requirement to be a member of the Euro European Union. No country is allowed to be a member of the EU unless it has abolished the death penalty. Those in green and brown <coughs> have abolished it for all except certain crimes or have a moratorium. Red shows those countries that still have the death penalty. And the only industrialized democratic countries in red are the United States and Japan. In the United States, the death penalty remains in force in 32 states and, of course, for uh, federal crimes and the U.S. military. In 2014, 35 people were executed in America. Some 3,000 remain on death row, and the large majority of those will probably end up with life sentences. Defense budgets. According to the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, in 2013, the United States spent as much on defense as the next 12 countries put together. You can see that on the bottom, the, uh, the comparing budgets and billions of dollars at the bottom right here. Military spending. Here's another way to look at military spending. So global spending, $1.75 trillion and the, with the United States spending 682 million uh, on the big black area on the right. Overseas development assistance. Now here are two charts. The first shows the amount of government aid given by country. The United States is on the left and you can see it gives by far the largest amount. In 2013 some 30 billion dollars. But in the second chart, you see the amounts as percentages of gross national income. Now, some years ago, there was an internationally agreed target that the country would try to contribute 0.7% of gross national income. And as you can see, in 2013, only five countries exceeded that target. Norway, Sweden, Luxembourg, Denmark, and the UK is just got its nose ahead of the line. The United States is well down the list. It's about the seventh or eighth from the right-hand side, along with Portugal and Spain. 
international treaties and conventions. The United States is notice noticeably absent from quite a number of interna important international treaties and conventions. One important one is the Rome Statute, which legally established the International Criminal Court at the Hague in, in Netherlands, in, uh, at the Hague in Netherlands. 123 countries are members, but the United States is not. And look at some of these others here. It shows the third one down, Mind Man Convention. Number of states parties, 162. Not signed by the United States. Convention on the Law of the Sea, entered into force, ratified and exceeded by 166 states. The Senate has not yet voted. Convention on the Rights of the Child, 194 states parties, signed by the United States in 1995, but not yet ratified. Convention, of, <clears throat> Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. States parties, 188, signed by the United States in 1980, but not yet ratified. Let's turn to other matters. Baseball. <laughs> Here's a chart where baseball is played in the world. Now, I'm always amused that the World Series is played by men on high salaries, but only involves teams from the United States. America can be very exceptional indeed when it has a World Series that doesn't involve the rest of the world. <laughs> and if the Little League can do it, why the heck can't the men do it? And the Little League did it just this weekend when uh, the United States played Japan and Japan won. Soccer. Fortunately, the United States women are willing to take on foreigners, and they have proved to be exceptionally good at it. They won the World Cup title earlier this year uh, with a crushing victory, as it says there. Football. In the, in the NFL, however, again, men generally don't play foreigners. I don't know why it is that men don't seem to want to play games with foreigners. Although American football is now played in several countries, I believe in about 18 of the 200 or so countries in the world, this is how the NFL uh, Super Bowl record looks like. American exceptionalism scores again. Of course, it actually should read 49, but I couldn't find a slide that says 49. So. <laughs> However, back to the serious aspects of American exceptionalism. One significant aspect of being a superpower is that the United States has more options for military, economic, and political action than other countries. <coughs> but even this is a double-edged sword. Having more options also carries with it more responsibility for leadership and for making decisions. And inevitably, some of these decisions will not be well received in some quarters. Exporting American concepts of democracy and liberty and freedom will not always be popular to regimes with a culture history, and a system of government that are far from that of the United States. Exceptionalism is not an easily exportable commodity. If it were, it wouldn't be exceptional, would it? Another practical factor we must recognize is that the United States is very fortunate geographically. Almost all its territory is situated in the temperate zone, neither too hot nor too cold, and blessed with large areas of agricultural land and it has plenty of raw materials and natural resources. And of course, internationally, it has borders with only two neighbors, neither of which is a threat to the United States national security. In some ways, it is perhaps this geographical separation from most of the rest of the world that has given the United States the distance and space to develop like no other. But distance and space themselves are insufficient to account for American exceptionalism. And therefore, we have to come back to the concept of ideas and values. It has often been said that America is an ongoing experiment. It is an experiment that cannot be repeated elsewhere, not even in Canada, due to combinations of history, politics, religion, culture, geography, and other factors. And even for that reason alone, therefore, America is exceptional. No nation is a finished piece of work. And certainly no American claims that the United States is without blemish. A set of charts showing inadequacies in this or that could have been drawn up for every country. And for quite a few countries, that set that I showed you today uh, could have been much larger 
uh, uh, in, in their, own, their own deficiencies. But the unique quality about America is that it is a voyage not for purely materialistic aims, as de Tocqueville said, or based on a list of historic precedents, but it's a voyage based on a set of ideas. The Declaration of Independence wisely stated the pursuit of happiness, not the achievement of happiness. And the American ideology has no specific destination. It is how the journey unfolds that matters. It is better to travel than to arrive. Now, whether you're a supporter of President Obama or not, he has shown on several occasions that he can make a very good speech. And his speech at Selma last March really was an excellent one. If you didn't watch it on television or read it afterwards, I really do urge you to do so. So I'm gonna close with a few extracts, not for what he said about Selma, but for the way he described American exceptionalism. He said, what greater expression of faith in the American experiment than this? What greater form of patriotism is there than the belief that America is not yet finished, that we are strong enough to be self-critical, that each successive generation can look upon our imperfections and decide that it is in our power to remake this nation to more closely align with our highest ideals. That's why Selma is not some outlier in the American experience. That's why it's not a museum or a static monument to behold from a distance. It is instead the manifestation of a creed written into our founding documents. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. These are not just words, these are a living thing, a call to action, a roadmap for citizenship, and an, and an insistence in the capacity of free men and women to shape their own destiny. It's the idea held by generations of citizens who believed that America is a constant work in progress, who believe that loving this country requires more than singing its praises or avoiding uncomfortable truths. It requires the occasional disruption, the willingness to speak out for what's right and shake up the status quo. That's what it means to love America. That's what it means to believe in America. That's what it means when we say America is exceptional. Having said my piece, it's now up to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now, I, I, I believe rather than question and answer here, the, this is some subject you're going to have some views on. And I, I, I would encourage a discussion. I'd suggest that the reason that we are exceptional to the degree that we are is probably accounted for the fact that we are relatively young and that we are a mixture of many, many different races and many different traditions and that we don't have to fall back on traditions that go back maybe hundreds or thousands of years that we were uninhibited in developing ourselves and therefore we weren't hindered by a lot of the things that normally hinder other nations. Um, and I think that that's probably why we have been exceptional. That's not to say that we've always been right and I fear that we probably are heading into some rough waters because I think that more frequently we're not right. But I think that up to this point, uh, we, we've been relatively uninhibited and uh, that has contributed to our strength. And as an example, while we do spend more on defense, we do that because most of the other free countries of the world look upon us, depend upon us to defend them so that we take responsibilities that are perhaps beyond what we can always assume to be adequate or proper. But we are willing to do that to defend what we believe in right or wrong. So I think that that's what creates the exceptionalism to the degree that it's desirable. Thank you. Uh, 
One point, one aspect of exceptionalism that I thought you were going to touch on uh, and didn't is its relationship, at least the rhetorical, belligerent side of exceptionalism in America with uh, perhaps imprudent ventures abroad, uh, particularly since 9-11, uh, including Iraq twice, Libya, uh, and so on. Any thoughts on that at all? Every country that's a superpower, I mean, the British did it, the French did it, the Spanish did it, the Romans did it, you know, tends to uh, pursue their foreign policy abroad and get involved in, in things which they believe at the time are well justified and then uh, with the looking in the rear, the rear mirror uh, of history, then they sort of really wonder about it. Um, I was at the United Nations uh, and uh, as you'd heard well, my introduction, I was involved in the arms inspections and weapons inspections in Iraq. I remember watching Colin Powell at the UN Security Council on the day that he, he was uh, making that speech um, with the head of the CIA sitting behind him uh, and uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, Iraq had uh, weapons of, of mass destruction. And I knew from my own experience that they had no nuclear weapons of mass destruction. We had, we had destroyed uh, their capacity to do that. Uh, not only had some been destroyed by Tomahawk missiles, but we came across things which the missiles had never even touched and we destroyed them. Uh, they had no delivery system, no, no bombers, uh, and I was the chief inspector of a couple of the ballistic missile inspections, and I knew that we had uh, accounted for everything except possibly 20 of their Scud missiles, and any that they might exist, basically uh, had not been used, had not been refueled, had not been trained. They were pieces of agricultural machinery that wouldn't have worked. Uh, I knew that he didn't have biological weapons. Biological weapons are very difficult to weaponize, and he'd not got that far. The only thing that he might have had would be battlefield chemical weapons. And in the end, if you remember, uh, that invasion took place uh, and uh, uh, then um, uh, the, the CIA sent in a team to find and they didn't even find those. Uh, and uh, it was kind of whipped up uh, at the time, it seemed to me, both for political reasons and for, um, uh, uh, the, by the media. Uh, and, and I think there's always a danger of that. Uh, so, I, I think it, it, in, a, in a sense it goes with the territory of being a superpower uh, because, as I say, uh, superpowers have more options for action. If you, if you take, if you're America, you have options from A to Z because uh, you have the power, the military power, the responsibility of leadership and everything else. If you're a small country like UK, your options are only probably A to F, you know. If you're uh, uh, Denmark, the A to C. Uh, if you're Luxembourg or Romania, uh, they're A or not even A at all. Do you see what I'm getting at? And so what happens is that um, uh, big countries are always going to be faced with uh, the, this challenge uh, of what they should do about it. And, um, and, and I think these, whoever's in the White House, be he or she, Republican or Democrat, uh, is always going to be faced with this thing. Some of you know I've mentioned this before in conversation. I think the telephone call uh, that no president wants to hear at three o'clock in the morning is, Mr. President, we have to tell you um, that um, uh, Israel has launched an attack on Iran. Because in those circumstances, the United States would be forced uh, uh, by its security uh, agreements with Israel to come to that assistance. And in so doing, you know, Iran is 80 million people not 22 million people like Iraq. Uh, it's a very significant country and there will be a whole host of unpredictable consequences. And unfortunately, therefore, long-winded answer, I'm afraid, but uh, I, I think um, uh, the, 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 the pressures that are on the leadership, the political leadership of, of any particularly powerful country, any superpower, are such that every now and again, there will be these ventures which, with the benefit of hindsight, one would say, mm, I wish we hadn't done that. And, 
it's not an answer particularly, but I mean, you, you, you know, that's the way I feel. Sorry, then. Given your experience with arms control, how comfortable are you with the inspections protocol under the uh, Iranian agreement? I'm in favor of the Iranian deal. Uh, I think the Iranian deal um, uh, is, is bound to have its difficulties. It's bound to have its challenges. Um, there are bound to be uh, times um, when virtually all hell will break loose between what are the Iranians up to, are they cheating or not, or whatever the case may be. Um, but uh, in any international or any negotiation on a difficult subject, concessions and compromises always have to be made. Otherwise, you don't get a deal at all. Um, <coughs> I think there are, there are weaknesses in the, uh, in the deal um, that has been done. But from my own experience, personal experience of, deal, uh, of working with inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency, they are feet on the ground, head screwed on, hard-nosed people. They, they, they are not easy uh, uh, um, uh, rollovers by, by any means. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, that the deal that came out was probably as good as could be achieved. Um, bearing in mind that it had to be an international deal, deal and therefore the United States had to also to hold not just Britain and France and Germany and the EU, EU at the table, but had to keep Russia and China at the table. Um, uh, because otherwise, um, uh, the sanctions, the international sanctions that, are, uh, that work have to, be, uh, have to be applied by Russia and China as well. Um, the arguments that, well, it would be better to have stayed the course and argued for a, uh, more sanctions, I, I suspect that they really got to the stage where they felt that they, they were not going to be able to do that uh, um, because Russia and China would sort of begin to dig their heels in. And um, so overall, I think the alternative, of course, is if there'd been no deal, then the risk of, uh, um, of uh, uh, Iran going ahead, achieving breakout, breakout uh, uh, and uh, achieving some sort of nuclear weapon uh, uh, capability within two or three months. Um, uh, whereas that has been put off for at least 10 or 15 years, 10 years and 15 years. And that is better than, than having no deal at all. So I'm in favor of it. Well, first, I want to defend Vermont. We have more guns per capita than any other state except North Dakota. And we are at the very bottom when it comes to gun violence. So, in a sense, I'm not a fan of guns, but it's an interesting point. Also, I'd like you to expand on de Tocqueville's observation was uh, something, and I'm paraphrasing, that when politicians discover they can buy voters with their own money, blah, 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 blah. So that seems to be what's happening. Could you, why don't other countries have this same problem? I personally think the American political system is seriously compromised. It's compromised by three things, um, three major things. One is gerrymandering, and both the parties have done it. One is money, uh, and as, as, as Trump says, hey, I don't need anyone to buy me because he brings a billion dollars of his own money to it. Uh, but, uh, but the others ought to have these super PACs. And once you do that, if I'm a pharmaceutical industry and I sort of say, look, I can help you get yourself elected and my uh, company will uh, be able to give you $100,000 towards your election campaign. And when you're a member of the Appropriations Committee, I do hope you'll remember who gave you the $100,000. That to me is wrong. And well, the, I'm, and the I'm, third... talking, I'm talking about it from the other direction. A politician says, for instance, I will give you all eyeglasses or I'll give you all summer camps for your kids and gets votes that way. So I, I understand the lobbyist influence and the money coming to the politicians, but the politicians buying voters, voters by saying, I'll give you oh, this, I... I'll give you that. Well, Judy, I mean, you've been a politician in, in your life and uh, you know what it is. Uh, uh, there's a great tendency in a democratic society to try to, to win as many votes as, pe as possible by promising that you can do things. 
But as, as Governor Cuomo once said, you know, you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a fact of life. The third thing that I think has compromised American uh, 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 politics is the politicization of the Supreme Court. But here I'm opening another seam of... Uh, 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 Steve? First, I'd like to thank you, Derek. I thought that was an absolutely wonderfully stimulating talk. And, 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 uh, um, and it raised in, in, uh, in my mind um, a couple of observations. One, um, that the first part of the talk was about the great American experiment, the political experiment, and, 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 and the radical change in systems of governance that it represented. And I think one could argue that we have become less exceptional over time as a result of the enormous success of that experiment. Uh, it has spread virtually across the world. Uh, uh, democracy, uh, which, which was essentially non-existent outside North America uh, at the beginning, is now uh, the norm uh, in, in, uh, across all of, Europe, all of the industrialized world, and increasingly in the developing world. So that the great idea that America represented, and that we still represent, I think, in, in the ways that Ralph articulated um, is, um, is, is, a, is an enormous success story, but ironically, it's made us less exceptional, uh, at least in political terms. In fact, I'd argue that there are a number of modern democracies which now surpass us in terms both of the services and support they provide to their citizens and the extent of their democratic processes. Um, and then we get to the, the downside of the presentation, which is all the ways uh, in which we are exceptional by virtue of our failures. Um, and there, what it brought to mind is how different those numbers look today, or, or the, comparative, the comparative numbers, uh, from how they might have looked 50 years ago. Uh, it seems to me that in the aftermath of World War II and in the decade or two that followed, um, in many of those comparisons, we would have looked far better uh, than we do today. Uh, and in that sense, I think uh, we've lost a lot of ground. Uh, and uh, it makes me, it, it discourages me to be reminded. Uh, I mean, nothing that you showed us is anything that we don't read kind of daily in the American press, and yet putting it together the way you did, it's profoundly depressing. Uh, and um, those are just two thoughts that come to mind, mm -hmm. having heard what you had to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if I may just go back to the Iranian yes. question, and that uh, there were two, well, more than two that confuse me, but two specifically, one is why we have to give them 24 days before we can go in and examine anything. The other is why do we have to pay trillions of dollars or billions of dollars so that they won't develop these things? Uh, it just seems like we're being held like a blackmailer that we have to pay this money. But, but in fact, it's their money. Pardon? It's their money. The money that's been frozen by the sanctions is their money. And at that's their money, so we're giving it back to them. Yeah. How did we get it to begin with? See, well, that's but, what but I don't the, the sanctions froze the assets, the assets okay. that Iran that had here. abroad. The international sanctions froze them, okay. which meant that Iran, uh, the government could not use them. And then on top of that, there were sanctions on trade, which stopped countries doing trade. So right. spare parts for aircraft, spare parts for all kinds of things Iran can't get. Now, once in fact those sanctions are lifted, right. and let us assume that the, the, the deal will start being implemented after the transition date, um, uh, which is, has got to be achieved within six months from uh, late July, um, then, in fact, uh, uh, they will be ha the, 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 their financial assets will be unfrozen, and they will be able to have access to those assets, which they haven't had for several years. 
So, Thank you. so it's their money there in that sense. But um, Thank you. who who else was? Oh, Bruce. Uh -huh. You said you said at one point that you were uh, had your tongue firmly in your cheek on some of these comments, but I think, if I may say, you played a bit of a dirty trick <laughs> by starting out, as Steve said, enunciating, uh, repeating, reminding us of the great principles on which the country was founded. And then turning the tables as you came to your next section and showing us all the places that we were falling short, short of our own principles and expectations. And I think somebody listening to this would say, what a bunch of hypocrites those Americans are. They preach one thing and they do something entirely different. And yet I don't buy that idea that we are a bunch of hypocrites. I think on the contrary, as Steve said, we have made progress backward recently in, in attaining our, our ideals and goals, but they are still our ideals and goals, and we freely admit the defects that our domestic society is, has, is suffering from. The, I guess the bottom line is that uh, I think our ideals are still the ideals that the rest of the world will someday, I hope, embrace. And part of the uh, market test is that we are discussing immigration, which means that we have very large numbers of immigrants coming to what I guess many of them still see as a land of opportunity, despite our manifest defects, which you have created in front of us. And if our, I, you have to look at who's voting with their feet. How many countries are there in the world where our citizens would choose to go and live instead of here. Okay. Well, I, 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 I stand duly reproved, uh, Bruce. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the French always talk about perfidious Albion, l'Albion perfide, and I'm afraid if you feel that I've played you a dirty trick, I'm sorry about that. But on the other hand, what I was trying to say is that uh, the ideas that underlie American exceptionalism uh, the ideas and the ideals are appreciated uh, uh, by widely by, by, by many uh, 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 foreigners in the world. Um, uh, but um, uh, what I try to demonstrate is that the way that those ideas are translated into values and, 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 the, and foreigners question some of the values of American exceptional. I mean, how is it that you haven't signed so many treaties? How is it that you can have the rich getting so much, the 1% and all the rest of it? How is it that you can have so many gun deaths and do nothing about gun control? How is it, how is it, how is it? And, and, and it's the questioning uh, of, of the values that is there. But, um, but yes, uh, uh, you know, my wife and I moved here when I left the United Nations in 2000. And, uh, and two, we moved here in 2002, and uh, lived happily ever after. Uh, that's the way that we look at life, uh, because um, uh, America has got so much uh, uh, going for it. But, it. but as I say, you know, um, the, the whole concept of ideas is that it's a changing, in, uh, a changing society. I mean, in our lifetimes, the world population has risen from two, million, two, two billion people in 1945, when the United Nations was invented, to now over 7 billion. Now, the, the world's carpet has, has not gotten any larger, but it's getting worn thin in places. And look at the immigration problem and the migration and the refugee problem that Europe now has. Um, uh, uh, and, and Europe has no idea how to deal with it. 
uh, uh, so it, it, I mean, it is. But, but the point that you make, I, I think, um, is that uh, um, uh, the, the, the ideas that lie under, that underlie, um, um, uh, that are the foundation of American exceptionalism are, 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 are very meritorious and, and, and very um, well worth uh, supporting. Um, but it sometimes it's the application of them uh, where 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 the fault lies. I, let me put another revolutionary thought to you, since we're here. I, I'm going to have to keep to the well lit streets in Manchester when I finish this talk. Um, um, when I look at the people who vote, you know, uh, and democracy gives vote, they vote to everybody who's uh, 18 and above. I sometimes wonder whether we're, that's right. If, if everybody in this country had to take the same citizen questions that my wife and I took, a hundred questions that we had to prepare for uh, uh, in order to gain our US citizenship, if everybody had to do that in order, uh, 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 so when you get to the age of 18, you actually are entitled to take the questions. And if you don't pass the test, you're not allowed to vote. And furthermore, like a driving license has to be renewed, then every 10 years, they should be all should take the questions again. Yes. And that, in fact, you know, uh, I'd, I'd love to see something like that. Of course, it's never going to happen. It's totally revolutionary because we've gone too far. Uh, but uh, uh, I look sometimes at, uh, uh, at the people. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this sort of uh, clip of, of, on, on a, uh, a college campus. Some person putting the microphone under some 19 and 20 year old sort of saying, who won the Civil War? And there's a long pause and then somebody says, well, I think we did, didn't we? Uh, you know, um, and uh, the next question was, uh, who do we get our independence from? Uh, Canada, uh, you know? And the next uh, uh, question was, what's the name of the vice president? Ah, well, who is Angelie Jolie married to? Oh, well, of course, everybody knew that, you know? And I'm thinking, my God, these people have the vote, you know? But there we are, we're, we're uh, that's, it, 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 you can't repair that. We're, we are where we are. Uh, but, um, sorry, you've got me off on another tangent. Yeah. Anyway, look, you've been very patient. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah.